So I want to thank everybody as well for joining our webinar this evening. Uh, Andy asked me to speak on some topics that the group had provided, specifically seasonal allergies, respiratory issues, heaves, um, but also, as mentioned, you know, we're all going through uh, an interesting, different time right now. We're not going to shows. We're, you know, not bringing in the same income potentially as we were before. So the question I'm getting a lot is how do I maintain my horse's health but cut back uh, on the feed budget um, without sacrificing any of the health benefits in the diet. So we'll touch on those as well. So I want to start out. When I think about um, allergies and breathing issues, it's really a hypersensitivity of the immune system. And so the immune system is really ramping up to try and get rid of whatever it is that is attacking the body. Um, and so what we want to do is try and decrease some of that overactive immune system by using anti-inflammatory properties. And the nutritional way to do that is through omega-3 fatty acids. Well, what is an omega, what is a fatty acid? Well, fatty acids are the building blocks of fats in the horse's body. Fat in food that horses eat, it's an energy storage unit. Um, the body can break down and use fatty acids for energy if there's not enough blood sugar. So if there's not carbohydrates in the diet, then the animal's gonna revert to using fats as a calorie source. Now, whenever you put the word essential in front of a nutrient, if we talk about essential amino acids or essential fatty acid, what it means in the true definition is that the body cannot make these ingredients, these nutrients. They have to be consumed in the diet. Unlike something like a B vitamin, which is not an essential nutrient, doesn't mean that the horse doesn't need it, but what it means is B vitamins are created by the bacteria that live in the hindgut. So they can create B vitamins by what foods you feed them um, within their body. Essential fatty acids and lysine, for example, an essential amino acid must be consumed in the diet. The body cannot make them. So both omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are considered essential. They have to be consumed. But if we look at the little chart on the right-hand side of the slide there, you can see that Omega-6 fatty acids, they start out as linoleic acid, and then they go through a couple of different um, secondary factors. And what omega-6 fatty acids are responsible for is pro, a pro-inflammatory response. So when a bee stings you and you get a swelling because it's bringing nutrients and blood to the area to try and get rid of whatever has invaded the body there. That's your pro-inflammatory response. Omega-3 fatty acids start with linolenic acid, and then we have these other uh, types of omega-3 fatty acids, these EPA and DHA, and that leads us to an anti-inflammatory benefit. All right. So as I mentioned, the Allergies are a hyper immune system. It's a, a lot of inflammation. And so our goal is to decrease inflammation. So we want to feed omega-3 fatty acids. But we want to make sure that we're feeding the omega-3 fatty acids that are useful. So if I break it down and we look at fatty acids and we look at fats and fatty acids, and we, I always find it's easier to, um, in, to visualize our own diets we hear the words saturated fats and unsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, and it just gets all a little confusing. Some people eat a lot of fat. Some people don't eat much fat. But if we break it down, fats and fatty acids are in two different categories. We've got saturated fats, which is your animal fats, butter and lard, and then your unsaturated fats, which get broken down into either polyunsaturated or monounsaturated now, omega-3s and omega-6s are polyunsaturated fats. And if you look at your omega-6s, we'll go to the middle. Primarily, they're going to come from corn oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil. 
omega-3 fatty acids are going to come in the plant form. So the ALA or alpha linolenic acid is going to come from your flaxseed, your soybean, um, canola is rapeseed oil, but your EPA and your DHA, which we'll come to find out are the most important, are going to come from your marine-based sources and your marine-based sources like fish, they're going to get that from algae. Now, your monounsaturated fats is your omega-9 fatty acids. Remember, I didn't mention anything about omega-9 fatty acids being essential in the horse. They're not, as, they're not considered essential fatty acids in horses. But in our diets, olive oil, avocados, peanuts, and almonds is where we get our omega-9 fatty acids. So I mentioned that this ALA, which we're getting from flax, chia, hemp, that has to get converted to DHA and EPA in order to have any benefit in the body. So all of the anti-inflammatory properties that we see from omega-3 fatty acids, that actually comes from the DHA and EPA. And unfortunately, that conversion from ALA to DHA and EPA is very poor. So if you're currently feeding your horse a lot of flax, hoping that you're gonna get these anti-inflammatory benefits, it's really not going to Um, we want to make sure that we are feeding these marine-based, your fish or algae-based supplements. So that's where we came with the product DHA Perform. And it is straight DHA. If you look at it, it's kind of flaky, almost looks a little bit like fish food, but it's very, very concentrated in DHA. That's the only active ingredient in it. Uh, about 4.8 grams of DHA per ounce. Uh, and all of the research that has been done on DHA and all of the benefits, be it brain and eye development, or anti-inflammatory properties, or reproductive health, de increasing the immune response in horses, has been when fed anywhere between that 10 to 15 grams of DHA per day. So you can see in my directions for use, maintenance is two ounces of DHA performed per day. So that's going to give you right around that nine to 10 ounces, um, grams of DHA. When we're looking at performance and breeding, or if we've got some uh, inflammation occurring, then we're looking at feeding four to six ounces. So we'll have significantly more DHA to have those benefits in the horse. So what kind of things are these omega-3 fatty acids touted to do? And when I say omega-3 fatty acids, in particular, the DHA, cardiovascular health, so lung and heart development, anti-inflammatory properties, which is really the um, mechanism behind its benefits with our heaves and respiratory disorders and our inflammatory re responses, um, lowering heart rate and exercising horses, brain, eye, and nerve function. Any women that have had children know that uh, we all take prenatal vitamins when we're pregnant, and DHA is now considered vital in those prenatal vitamins. Uh, reco increased recovery rate in horses, benefits to uh, recurrent airway obstruction disorder or heaves, and also improved semen quality and ovarian function in mares. So you can see that omega-3 fatty acids have effects across a wide range of different functions in the body. And that's because inflammation or decreasing inflammation in the body can have all of these benefits. So in particular, let's look at these airway disorders or recurrent airway obstruction or RAO or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD or heaves. And heaves kind of gets its name because when you see them constantly coughing, they get this heave line along the base of their barrel. 
Um, it's a lung disease similar to asthma. It's an allergic reaction to inhaled particulates. And why does it happen more often in the spring and in stable horses in the wintertime? Because in the springtime, we've got a lot of pollens and molds floating around in the air. But in the wintertime, horses are locked in stalls and we close the barn up to try and keep them warm. And so we also have a lot of dust floating around there. So it's that body's own response to try and expel those particulates. So we get this increased inflammation. And how do we get, how does the respiratory system try and get these toxins out? They create, it creates mucus. So we're constantly coughing, creating a lot of extra mucus to try and expel any of these toxins. So we have this chronic cough or heaving to expel this air and particulates. Now, exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, or bleeders, is a slightly different condition where we see the presence of blood in the airways, and it's come um, from the lungs. And you got to think about when the horse is exercising, the pressure of the blood supply pumping through the vessels can significantly increase. And so that pressure on those blood vessels actually is bursting those blood vessels. So what happens when we feed DHA to horses that have this genetic disorder of bleeding is that it increases the flexibility of those blood vessels so that when we have this intense pressure of all this blood in those blood vessels, the, the walls of the vessels just flex and they don't break and allow blood to seep out and eventually into the nostrils of the horse, as you can see in that photograph. So, you know, there have been some suggestion that adding clotting agents, for example, to feeds or supplements can help with bleeding, but it's not an issue with the horse either being able to or not being able to clot their own blood. They certainly can do that. It is an issue with the flexibility of the blood vessels that are in their respiratory tract. So as I mentioned, these omega-3 fatty acids, in particular the DHA, play a huge role in the flexibility of those cell walls. Um, and so when we have this increased pressure, those, those now elastic vessels are able to um, withstand that additional pressure. And this is research that has been done in horses, um, numerous research reports looking at feeding DHA in particular as an alternative therapy to things like Lasix and other drugs that people use uh, for horses that have these bleeding conditions. So DHA has been well researched as a, a really valuable alternative to drugs um, in these horses that have bleeding issues. You've seen this slide before. I, I just want to highlight again the fact that if we're feeding flax or chia or hemp or camelina or any number of other omega-3 fatty acid sources, plant sources, these are not used by the horse. It's the DHA and EPA that have, and I say DHA and EPA, it's the DHA in particular, but the EPA very easily converts back and forth to DHA. And it's the DHA that is having all of these benefits that we associate with omega-3 fatty acids. So adding flax to your horse's diet is, is not a great idea. And it's not pointless, but if we're really looking, if we really have a diagnosed issue where we're trying to decrease inflammation and really boost the amount of useful omega fatty acids for a specific, whether it be semen quality or respiratory health, we need to be feeding sources of DHA. You can see here when you break down the different omega-3 fatty acids, their primary uses. The ALA, which you're getting from chia and flax and hemp, is really just providing a source of energy and little more. Shiny hair coat as well. Um, EPA, cardiovascular function, and helps reduce inflammation, but it's the DHA, brain, visual, cardiovascular. Um, there's been also, there's been a lot of research in humans on learning and behavior in children that were and were not supplemented with DHA through um, either gestation and then 
in juvenile states, but we've also done that research in young growing foals. And it's been very interesting to study these foals and see that foals that were supplemented with DHA um, picked up tasks quicker, they learned tasks faster than horses that were not supplemented with DHA. So I think that that's a side note, but certainly um, reduces inflammation. And when we're talking about these seasonal allergies, we've got this ramped up immune function and we're just trying to decrease that inflammation a little, the DHA is beneficial. Uh, I mentioned uh, the exercise benefits. So horses supplemented with DHA, omega-3 fatty acids during exercise have lower heart rate compared to um, controls exercising at the same speed. It can help with um, cholesterol concentrates during exercise and recovery and help these horses with recurrent airway obstruction by reducing that pulmonary inflammation as well. Um, Now I want to point out that we don't use corn oil in any of our products. We don't use it in our DAC oil. We don't use it as a binder or mixer in any of our supplements and anymore. We've switched either to soybean oil or primarily canola oil. And the reason is we know that corn oil is very high in those omega-6 fatty acids, which cause that pro-inflammatory response. And our whole goal with horses, because stress comes at them from every different angle and stress increases inflammation, um, the environment is increasing inflammation, uh, exercise increases inflammation. So our goal with feeding horses is to decrease that inflammation. So we don't want to use corn oil at all. Now, I, just before I put this presentation together, I actually went on Wikipedia because there are a bunch of other different oils on the market that people always ask me about. And so this is just looking about the omega-6 fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids in different sources. You know, I get asked a lot about coconut oil or the um, prilled fat, the cool calories type product, um, and the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. So first of all, I look at the omega-6 column. I, I like to look at the omega-6s, because I really want to keep those down. So if I skim down here and I'm looking at, you know, corn oil has per tablespoon 7,224 milligrams of omega-6 fatty acids. Cottonseed oil, not that I don't think a lot of people feed that to horses, but again, very, very high in omega-6 fatty acids. Um, Peanut oil, very high. Um, unhydrogenated soybean oil is pretty high. But then what? I, what? I, the next column that I look at is the amount of omega-3s. So I want to keep the omega-6s low, but can I also boost up the omega-3? So if we look at something like cod liver oil, now we're not necessarily feeding cod liver oil. These were human examples here, but you can see it's very, in, very opposite. We've got very little omega-6 fatty acids and very high omega-3 fatty acids when we start to go to those marine-based sources. Now, while coconut oil is very low in omega-6 fatty acids, it's got no omega-3 fatty acids to speak of. Um, olive oil, again, it doesn't have very high omega-6 fatty acids, but it's got pretty much no omega-3 fatty acids either. So we want to make sure that when we're decreasing the omega-6s, that we're trying to find sources that have high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids as well. Coconut oil, the one I wanted to point out, like I said, no omega-3s. Palm oil is the other one. So palm oil is what is partially hydrogenated, and that is what makes something like cool calories. And palm oil, they're not very high omega-6 fatty acids, but also very, very low omega-3 fatty acids. Now, there are other benefits to feeding something like the cool calories is it's convenience-based, um, but if you're looking for omega-3 fatty acids, then you're not getting them. So the DHA Perform is one avenue by decreasing inflammation that is going to help with our respiratory seasonal allergy issues. But what if it's not just seasonal allergies? What if my horse has 
chronic allergies. Maybe it's just heightened in the spring, but I know that they're there year round. Anyone have a horse that kind of displays these kind of symptoms? You know, ulcery, dull coat, poor hooves, multiple different kind of allergies, allergies to food, skin allergies, really sensitive to flies, um, sensitive to different types of grasses. Uh, maybe we've tried them on a gastroguard, ulcerguard type product, and they were okay for a while, but then when we stopped feeding it, all of these symptoms came back. Chronic diarrhea, strong erratic behavior. If any of those are sounding familiar, well, maybe this is a different route of causing allergies. You know, there's there's multiple different reasons why horses might have these allergies. And I've kind of discussed the hyperinflammatory response to the seasons and pollen and toxins, but there is a gastrointestinal cause for allergies as well. So if we think about the gut lining, the gut lining, so these little cells here called mucosal cells, they line the intestine. And there's little fingers on top of those, and all they do is just increase the surface area, okay? And in between these intestinal cells are these things called tight junctions, and those tight junctions are like gates. And what they're supposed to do is stay closed and stop undigested food particles and toxins and bacteria, stop them from passing through into the bloodstream, and those would then be just passed out in the manure. They're supposed to open up and allow digested food particles, amino acids, glucose, whatever, to pass through. But what happens, so this is a nice, healthy, tight junction. Properly digested food particles are absorbed and everything else stays out. But what seems to happen when we have these horses that are under chronic stress, and stress comes from everywhere, um, we have a breakdown on these little tight junctions, these gates, and now we have undigested food particles leaking through the intestinal barrier and what happens when we have these undigested food particles and toxins and bacteria floating? It's just like the bee sting. It's just in a different area. Now it's more systemic because systemic inflammation, because now we've got this toxic material that's floating into the bloodstream that shouldn't be there. And in, a, in an animal, they're just going to try and fight that. They're going to bring inflammatory markers to the area to try and get that out of the bloodstream because it's not supposed to be there. Anything that goes where it's not supposed to be, there are functions in the body that try and get it out. And so inflammation, again, starts. I mentioned that stress, horses are bombarded by stress, whether it's um, physical stress of exercise and training and hauling or keeping them in stalls, changes in forages, changing grains, mold toxins, um, chronic antibiotics or your omeprazole based drugs. But the other thing to think of now, okay, so we're not necessarily physically stressing our horses with a lot of exercise and going to shows and trailering them, but a lot of us are at the mercy of our barns and some barns are closed and we can't go visit our horses. So there's psychological stress when you change a horse's routine. They're very routine animals. Um, so that can cause stress as well. Well, we know that these stresses, when we break down these cells in the gut, I mentioned one of those symptoms can be these transient um, or chronic allergy-like symptoms because we've got all this junk floating into the bloodstream causing again inflammation. Well, we know that zinc, zinc is a mineral that has numerous research studies done looking at its effect on the cells in the gut lining and its effect on strengthening those cells and strengthening those channels between those cells. Butyric acid is a short chain fatty acid, and it's one of these that is created by the bacteria that live in the hindgut. So when the horse's hindgut is really healthy, which is not the case in a stressed animal, those bacteria create butyric acid, and butyric acid also helps to feed these, these cells to keep them healthy so that they keep these gates in between these tight junctions strong and not allow all that junk to pass through. 
So there is a new product on the market and it's called Butapearl ZEQ and it is a combination of zinc and butyric acid. Primarily works in the hindgut and it improves those tight junctions. It increases the amount of bacteria that can live in the hindgut, which is really healthy. Um, and it improves that intestinal lining. So now we're using another nutritional method to decrease these allergies. It's unique, it's a unique micro encapsulation because again, we want to make sure that it gets through the acid in the stomach, through the enzymes in the small intestine and makes it to the hindgut. Um, so we use a sp sprayed freeze technology, these little micro pearls to get it to the hindgut of the horse where it can be effective. But just like everything, laminitis, colic, there's so many different causes for these issues, just like there's so many different causes for allergies and respiratory issues. And every horse is going to be different with what they respond to. Are they going to respond to feeding DHA perform? Are they going to, or is it more of a gut health issue that we need to be correcting? And I would say that if you're having some of those other symptoms like chronic diarrhea or ulcery like symptoms, then I would be leaning more towards the gut health to fix the allergies. But if you don't have any of those issues and we're just simply dealing with um, this heightened inflammatory response, then I would be going more towards the DHA. So this Butapearl ZEQ, this leaky gut issue, when we think about leaky gut, we think about colic. But as I mentioned, this systemic inflammation laminitis, chronic diarrhea, skin allergies, performance and behavior issues, all can be affected or caused by this chronic inflammation. So we've also put the butapearl ZEQ in the cool gut and in the rescue aid paste. So if you don't think your horse needs um, the cool gut, the, buta, buta, the Rescue Aid paste is a great alternative if we really just want to try and get some of this Butapearl ZEQ to try and correct some of these allergy issues. So that's my little bit on respiratory issues and allergies, and really it's it could be coming from multiple different sources. So we've kind of got more of a uh, direct way of dealing with it or an indirect way of dealing with it, either with DHA or with the, the leaky gut option. But the other question that Andy wanted me to address was, you know, feeding during these stressful times where we we want to feed the right feeds to our horses, we want to feed the right supplements, we want to keep them healthy, but we also want to be able to afford to do this. So number one, you need to feed enough forage to your horses you need to feed at least one and a half to two and a half percent of their body weight per day. And that's the one thing you cannot skimp on. You cannot skimp on the amount of fiber that you give your horse per day. So most of our thousand pound horses, that is, that's 15 to 25 pounds of hay per day. And I'm going to sit right in the middle and say right around that 20 pounds is ideal. And once we know what we're dealing with with the hay, then the only reason that we feed anything else grain or supplement is to complement or to correct what you're not getting out of your forage. We also need to meet the needs of your horse. So don't ask for a feed or a supplement because your neighbor feeds it or the latest person who won a blue ribbon feeds it. You need to meet the needs of your particular horse. And so the information that a veterinarian or nutritionist needs in order to meet the needs of your horse, we need to know their age, young or old. Are we dealing with a growing horse or a senior horse? I need to know their body weight because a lot of feeding directions are dictated by a horse's body weight and nutritional requirements are based on a horse's body weight. Um, and there are multiple ways to get an estimation of the horse's body weight. Obviously, if you have a scale, a livestock scale, that is ideal. That's the most accurate way. But a lot of us don't have access to a livestock scale. And we're certainly not just randomly going to our vet's office at the moment. We're trying to stay home. So you can use a weight tape. Um, but when the weight tape was developed, you can see the lady in the picture in the bottom what she's doing is she's putting that tape around the horse's girth and that measurement 
really is only calculating, see if I can get my, whoops, I'll see if I can get my drawing tools here. That weight tape estimates the barrel of the horse. So cut the neck off and this is what it's estimating on the horse, the main trunk. It's, it's, it's not factoring in really the horse. It's giving us, um, it's, it's factored in numbers for the amount that its legs weigh and its neck weighs and its head weighs. That's why the weight tape isn't always that accurate because it really only takes into account that cylinder of the horse's body. And based on the horse's circumference around its girth, it's also going to have a set length that that horse should be based on its circumference. So what if you've got a long backed horse, then he's really not going to have his weight estimated as well as a more proportionate horse. So then we have this equation that you can utilize and this equation um, utilizes the girth value. So girth Take that, that length around the horse's girth and times it by that number again. And then you take the length of the horse. So now we're factoring in the, the length of the horse. Now it's not guessing the length of the horse. Now we're giving it a number there. So we're taking into account the circumference and the length. We're giving it an actual value. And then we're going to divide that by 330 and we're going to get an estimate of the horse's body weight. So there are three different options for getting your horse's body weight. But what, but, but what none of those tell me is anything about the horse's body condition. You know, you might tell me your horse is a thousand pounds. Well, if it's a miniature horse, it's morbidly obese. But if it's a shire, it's emaciated. So we need to know a little bit about its body condition. I also want to know about its activity level, not its discipline. I don't really want to know if you do barrel racing or trail riding. I want to know about the amount of hours per week that you ride your horse, work your horse, and what um, intensity that you're working those horses under. Oops. So we want to judge body condition. And really, when we judge body condition, we want to take uh, an estimate of all of these different areas and combine them. So a horse that is a one, you can see that he is emaciated, his, all of his bones are sticking out, and no doubt this horse's behavior would be really dull and there's probably muck coming out of his eyes as well. Two, we're starting to get a little bit more coverage and he's a little bit more alert. Three, a little bit more coverage. But again, I want you to be putting your hands on your horse and really evaluating them accurately. A four, now is where we get into this gray area because you may have seen some endurance horses or thoroughbreds that this is their racing condition. But for most of our horses that we want to trail ride or do dressage with or, or barrel race, this is too thin or have broodmares, this is too thin. A five, now I don't have to push really hard to find the ribs, but you can see, I can't see the ribs. I can't see any of the bones poking out. This horse is in ideal body condition. Some people say, oh gosh, that horse looks so thin. No, this horse is in ideal body condition. I think that our idea of what is healthy has shifted. And so we think a horse that's a seven or an eight looks healthy, but this is healthy. This is the most healthy right here. Five and a six is really ideal, and I've given you two different genetic types of horse. Seven, you can start to see if I press over the ribs here, there's a lot more fat coverage. Eight and a nine, these horses are starting to get morbidly obese, and, and this is really fat. So I need to have an accurate estimation of their body condition. Visualize these pictures and then visualize your own horse. A lot of research has shown that we as owners constantly underestimate our horse's body condition and overestimate the amount of work that they actually do, which just exacerbates the cycle. We continue to feed them more because we're underestimating their body weight and overestimating the amount of exercise they do. I need to know what, current, what you're currently feeding them. What hay are you doing? Have you got an analysis on that hay? That would be great. Concentrate, what grain are you feeding? What supplements are you feeding? And I wanna know in pounds, not in scoops. Look at the amount of different scoops down there. 
you know, one person can say, well, I feed a scoop and they're using the bucket on the end and the other person is using this tiny little silver one um, near the left. So I need to know what kind of scoop you're doing. Ideally, I want to know how many pounds you're feeding, but if you can at least tell me the type of scoop you're using, that's going to help me. Special needs. Does your horse have tying up? Has it got HYPP, metabolic syndrome? And then what are your goals? Um, I want my horse to gain some weight. I don't want him to be crazy. I want him to have more stamina. Or I want him to recover better. Or he drags a toe, and can I fix that with nutrition? Uh, he's got allergies. How do I feed him to decrease those? So I need to know what your goals are as well. And so if we look here at um, a, a, this is a pretty decent hay, not by any means the best quality hay in the world, but a decent hay and a horse doing light exercise. And I would say at the moment, if you have a horse that is a hard keeper, then I would estimate, I would look at my the back of my bag and I would be giving him the amount of food that a horse in light exercise needs because that's going to give him some extra calories to tie and get some body weight on him. Um, so we've got a seven-year-old horse. He's a thousand pounds. He's a body condition score of six. So he was ideal body condition. Um, he's got no special needs. This grass hay was a pretty good one, like I said, at 12% crude protein and about 0.9 megacals per pound. And they were feeding him 20 pounds a day and no grain or supplements. And they wanted to know, what should I feed him to make sure he gets everything he needs? Well, if we orient ourselves to this graph, you can see that there's energy and crude protein and calcium, phosphorus, copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, iodine, lysine, vitamin A and vitamin E all along the bottom. And then up the vertical axis, we've got 25, 50, 75 and 100. So at 100, I've got a dark red line that goes across the graph. And if the bar touches that line, it means 100% of that nutrient has been met in the diet. So you could see the 20 pounds of hay is represented by the green and 100% of horses energy requirements were being met. Um, nearly 175% of his protein, his calcium, his phosphorus uh, was all being met by this hay. So no doubt this horse looked good, right? Because he's getting enough calories in his diet and that's really the only nutrient that we can see. We can see if he's fat or thin. But Copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, iodine, vitamin A and vitamin E were all deficient in this diet with just feeding hay. So we add a pound of oats because he's not really doing a lot of exercise and he wasn't out or uh, he, he didn't need a lot of extra calories. But I use that as something to carry the mineral on and two and a half ounces of DAC orange. And you can see that this diet is completely balanced now. Copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, iodine, all are being met in the diet by adding the DAC orange. So you can see how simple it can be because the other thing that we're constrained by at the moment is maybe there are less people working at the barn and so we don't want to have 50 different things that we're adding to little baggies when we go once a week to get our horses food ready or that other people are having to be responsible for adding. So you can see this is a very simple diet and everything is being met in this horse's diet. You know, I get questions a lot about you know, how do I how do I make it cheaper? And I've been to Tract Supply and I've found there's an all stock uh, sweet feed. My horse likes it. And, you know, it's nine bucks a bag or something. And so I, I'm I, how would that be in my horse's diet? So this particular product um, produces Pride 12% all stock sweet feed. Based on the nutrients on the guaranteed analysis, I plugged it into my ration balancing program and I fed 20 pounds of grass hay to this horse. And based on the feeding directions, it said I should feed about six pounds. So already there, wow, we're feeding six pounds. So it's not as inexpensive as I thought because I got to feed quite a bit of it. But 20 pounds of my hay and six pounds of the 12% all stock, and you can see this is what the diet looks like. We're deficient in nearly everything. Energy is maybe close. Uh, in order to balance this diet, I had to feed 10 pounds of this all stock in order to get 
all of the nutrients that I needed. And so when I worked that out, that cost me about a buck 89, not even factoring in the hay, about a buck 89 to feed this grain to this horse in order to get everything they needed. So it was cheap, but it wasn't inexpensive in the end because I had to feed a lot of it. Now, we take a slightly better quality hay and four to six pounds of oats, three ounces of DAC orange, still not, a, not an amazing hay, um, just an average hay. And based on, again, I looked on Tractor Supply, their cost for a bag of oats and their uh, cost um, wholesale or retail cost, I should say, for DAC orange, three ounces of DAC orange and your four to six pounds of oats is going to cost $1.66 a day to feed the horse. And so you can see this was also inexpensive, but it wasn't cheap. It was inexpensive, but it was still quality and it was simple and it meets the needs of what we need right now. You know, we don't need a lot of extra bells and whistles. We just need to keep our horses healthy and we need to keep the people that are feeding our horses sane. So the one supplement that no matter whether we're in a pandemic or not, that I think must be in every horse's diet is the DAC digestive feed additive. And the reason why I think this is we're paying money for hay and grain and supplements, and we want to get the most bang for our buck out of them. So the DDA has ingredients in it, like the YSAC and the biomass and the integral, which is going to bind mold toxins. These ingredients are biomass is going to help boost the immune function. It's going to help with that intestinal integrity. The YSAC is live cell yeast culture, and it's going to help increase fiber digestion. It's going to increase mineral digestion. Um, it's going to help stabilize the hindgut. And so our horses, as I mentioned, they may not be going to places. We may not be doing intense exercise with them, but we 100% are stressing them because their routine has changed. Um, there's feeding changes, there's staff changes, and that lack of exercise. So I think the DDA is a must. I, my little mantra is that every horse every day should eat the DDA without question. Um, so what questions do you have for me? You can type them in. Um, we can unmute. 